and you can get uh, brutalized uh, by Pinkertons uh, who are hired by the U.S. Marshals and you can get ambushed by the uh, Fraudulent Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, but you still have to have your jokes. We can't take your jokes away from you. And for their wedding, Mark and Sally received lots of gifts that said his and hers, and they got another one that said us, a United States Army blanket. And why does a husband, a little boy said to his daddy, Daddy, does a husband boss the house? And the husband says, No, son, the husband houses the boss. And why does Peter play his wedding videotape backwards? Why does Peter play his wedding videotape backwards? So he can see himself walk out of church a free man. We are reporting to you on the law breaking, lying, and covering up of Cablevision. Charles Dolan, John Tata, and William Quinn. And the uh, first thing that I want to read to you is a report of a meeting between Charles Dolan and investors in Cablevision who are getting fed up with the indebtedness. An article in the New York Times uh, and it tells of a meeting with Martin Gabelli who is an investor in Cablevision and with Charles Dolan, Charles F. Dolan, uh, and that Mr. Gabelli was not at all happy with the performance of Cablevision stock. <laughs> it's never paid any dividends. Uh, and the stock has dropped from $69 to $33. So this is a good time to buy your one share of Cablevision stock and become a shareholder and have a say. And Wall Street is not happy with uh, Cablevision. And the managers of Cablevision are warned to cut $4 billion in debt. So there's a lot of pressure on Cablevision to shape up and act like a profit-making company. Uh, Charles Dolan, as you just know, has bought ITT's half of uh, the Knicks and the Rangers in Madison Square Garden. You remember five years ago how unhappy uh, we all were when Charles Dolan pulled uh, one of his tantrums and refused to carry Madison Square Garden. We have a similar thing going on with classic sports. Uh, Cablevision wants, Charles Dolan wants a piece of classic sports and classic sports says no and Cablevision says okay then we won't carry classic sports anymore. Abuse of power abuse of the public against public interest. Now this is the same thing uh, Dolan, Tata, Quinn pulled on Glendora. We don't like your reports about the Department of Consumer Affairs. We don't like your reports about Galata not doing his job. So we're going to take you off of TV. And they did. Ignorance and arrogance. And the court says, no, you can't do that. Plaintiff has a statutory right to be on television and must be returned to television. And she was. I was off for about nine months. Uh, we have another case of this with Andrew Herzman. Andrew Herzman has a Cablevision hate page on the internet. And he got a letter. I told you about all this. I read you the letter from Cablevision's Cricket law firm, Sadly Stevens, Burke and Burke, 230 Park Avenue, the law firm that I have defeated for the past three years. And the law firm told, in fact, this was Mark Fowler, former commissioner of the FCC, who might be at oral argument in Glendora versus Cablevision before the Second Circuit, the United States Court of Appeals. Mr. Fowler told Mr. Herzman that he'd have to take down the Cablevision hate page. 
Uh, Mr. Herzman uh, didn't, or did, I guess, for a while, and then put it back up, or something like that. And uh, there really was no way that Cablevision could sue Herzman, because he wasn't telling things that were lies. He was telling the truth. There was no libel case. And there's really no way uh, they could uh, make him take it down. Uh, Herzman has the freedom of speech to do so, but guess what they did? Herzman works for Court TV. Okay? Cablevision went to Herzman, boss, rattled the cage, and said, if uh, Herzman doesn't take down the Cablevision hate page, then Cablevision is not going to cablecast Court TV. That's how dirty they got. Mr. Herzman, at this point, uh, doesn't know what to do. What would you do if your job and your livelihood was threatened? And Mr. Herzman is a uh, television technician. And so uh, if he doesn't do what he's coerced to do by Cablevision and by Court TV, great and wonderful Court TV who's trying to bring the public justice, exposure of justice, hypocrites. Uh, if Mr. Herzman doesn't do what they are coercing him to do, then Mr. Herzman's going to lose his job at Court TV, and Mr. Herzman is going to uh, be blackballed throughout the whole industry and probably never get another job again. This is how dirty cable vision is. What else is there to talk to you about cable vision? I, of course, have had no time the past three weeks to add up the uh, their damages over the past uh, three years upon me as to money spent. It's almost $10,000 that I have had to spend fighting them on postage and on printing and on rip-off court stenographer fees. I did tell you, didn't I, that I recouped $106, I think it was. Uh, Bryant did sign the order uh, to make the uh, United States government pay for uh, the rip-off court stenographer fees of Myron, Byron, his name is Birnbaum, Marvin Birnbaum. And uh, so I got that money back, and I thank Judge Bryant for that. Uh, Cablevision has never paid Franklin the $350 they robbed Franklin of when the trial was stayed. Uh, Dolan, Todd, and Quinn should have returned the subpoena money, but instead of that, they deposited it in their bank. Billionaires de stole Franklin's $350 and all of the interest that he would have had on that money. Nor has Cablevision paid me $105 that Judge Bryant ordered them to pay me for the audio tape that Callagy, their crooked lawyer, ordered uh, and never paid the money for. I produced the tape and uh, I was never given the money for it. Uh, big matter. Town of Oyster Bay. Franchise renewal. April 1997. Go down to Town Hall and get a copy of the proposed new franchise. Find out when the public meeting is going to be held and go there and protest your rights that any cable company in the state of New York with more than 21 channels has to provide a full-time, fully designated public access channel. No more shared telecare. We are entitled to our own public access channel. So go down there and make sure you get that right. Also the town of Hempstead, which refused to show Andreas the copy of the new proposed franchise agreement. Do to be renewed in April of 1997, this year. And this is March, so we've just got one month. Get down there to the Hempstead Town Hall and get a copy of the proposed franchise. Find out when the public meeting is and go there and demand your own fully designated, full-time public access channel. I asked Cablevision for a special. There is a whole lot of Nassau news going on here with Bruiser Ken, uh, the U.S. Marshal Service, which you can't trust anymore, and the so-called 
well, I call them the Fraudulent Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, and their ambush. A whole lot that's going on here, right in your backyard, that has to be reported to you. And so it's more than one half hour a week, these reports. And so I asked for a special uh, to take care of another half hour that is of interest. It's your edition, Long Island edition. And I was told that, well, everybody wants time. Uh, Rich uh, Einhorn wants time. Dr. Carley wants time. You want a special? And I said, yes, and that's why we need our own designated public access channel. Why should we be on the fringe of telecare? We can't go on TV until 10 p.m. at night. Why? Because Mr. Dolan is pulling another fast one. And Mr. Dolan is pulling the polyester over the eyes of the residents of Long Island. So you get out there and get what you're entitled to, which is your own public access channel. No more. Share. Telecare. Uh, Anthony DeMarco and Rebecca Carley, MD, have started a movement, the fellow recipients of injustice in the United States courts. It is superlative. Uh, this is a page one of their five-page paper. And I am going to read it to you, uh, the first paragraph or so. Because what they have stated is the truth, through and through. And they state it a whole lot better than I do. The Constitution of the United States was designed to create three separate independent branches of government, the legislative branch to enact the laws, the executive branch to enforce the laws, and the judicial branch to interpret the laws. The intent of the Founding Fathers was to create a system with checks and balances to keep the power of government within the boundaries set by law. One of the primary purposes given in the preamble for establishing the Constitution was to establish justice and security of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. So then, how can it be that so many of us have gone without justice for so long, in Tony DeMarco's case, for over 20 years? As noted in Edmund Mann's excellent treatise entitled, Who Watches Our Judges? Who watches our judges? Although less than three-tenths of one percent, less than three-tenths of one percent of our population are lawyers. Lawyers. 80% of our politicians in local, county, state, and federal government are lawyers. They wear Republican and Democrat hats, thus making their underlying unity less obvious, but this monopoly of power held by one group is in violation of the intent of the framers that no one group of individuals hold all the power in government. For, as Thomas Jefferson said, quote, if ever this vast country is brought under a single government, it will be one of extensive corruption and will be as venal and oppressive as the one from which we separated, meaning George III. This has already happened as all three branches of government at all levels are controlled by the American Bar Association, members of which are not licensed to practice in any state, but rather by the ABI, which is not overseen by any other agency. As if this wasn't scary enough, former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Warren Berger, repeatedly stated in speeches before bar associations that about 90% of our lawyers are not qualified to practice law. Since almost all judges are lawyers who become judges based on politics rather than on ability, it stands to reason that many of our judges are not qualified to practice law. Yet, it is the duty of those same judges to interpret the law. Common sense dictates that there should, therefore, be some mechanism in place to protect citizens from judges who make decisions based on bad judgment, political consequences, or even worse, corrupt intent. Is there any such protection? After all, federal judges have life tenure. Now folks, this is a wonderful piece and I will try to read to you some of it next week. 
but it is certainly vital to your existence. I'd like to point out to you a full page article in the New York Times, full page, about Alphonse D'Amato and how Alphonse D'Amato converted GOP funds and donations to help New York, to help Pataki. D'Amato converted donations to help New York candidates. This is a long, long article. It's a whole full page. I have said for a long time that I think there's a D'Amato connection with the efforts to get Glendora off of television and all the other things that happened to Glendora. I think there's a D'Amato connection. Uh, I think there's a D'Amato connection and a Republican Party connection with the New York State uh, Supreme Court Appellate Division for a second department in Brooklyn. I've told you before how I think they engineered uh, to try to get Judge Silverman to change his decision to put Glendora back on TV. They would dearly love to get rid of Glendora. So I repeat that I think there is a D'Amato connection and a Republican Party connection. Uh, what, there are many other uh, bulletins to read to you. Uh, this is what I call my think drawer. You've heard the expression, you don't get time to think. Okay, my think drawer got 18 days behind. I had things to be read and things to communicate to you, and that all got 18 days behind. Also, like Cablevision, is uh, all in debt. These people don't know how to run a com company. I don't know how to run a company either, but I know that I don't owe anybody a cent. I certainly know enough not to do that. The minute these bills come in, Franklin pays them the next day. Certainly, you don't have to be a CEO to know that. And also, Westinghouse uh, results are hurt by the losses at CBS. I called up Larry Tisch uh, three or four weeks ago. I call him up and I tell him what uh, John C. Malone is doing, uh, the TCI crook. Um, and Time Warner has sold its... Um, it has Time Warner owns part of Court TV, the ones who are trying to take uh, or cooperating with Cablevision to get down the Cablevision hate page by Andrew Herzman. Uh, and Stephen Brill, who's the owner and starter up of Court TV, founder I should say, uh, Time Warner is going to keep its stake in Court TV, but it has sold its stake in a lawyer publication called The American Lawyer. Uh, these uh, corporate people get their dirty fingers into everything. So there's, you know, there's nothing. They pollute everything. So there's nothing that's pure. Uh, okay, I told you about uh, distribution dispute in Snarl's Cablevision and Classic Sports. I told you about that. As a pro se, remember this, and I'm quoting to you from my uh, decision from the United States Court of Appeals, Second Circuit, that in view of the well-settled rule, particularly applicable in pro se civil rights actions, that a complaint should not be dismissed unless it appears beyond doubt that the plaintiff can prove no set of facts in support of her claim which would entitle her to relief. Branham versus Clark, Conley versus Gibson, and there was another one from ABC. Also, Judge Van Graven writes, to the extent, if any, that the state and federal statutes differ, to the extent, if any, that the state and federal statutes differ, the federal statutes control. Free up Glendora, in Glendora versus Cablevision, along with uh, Glendora versus Kofalt, James Kofalt and Cablevision, where Judge Silverman ruled that Glendora has to go back on TV. Gordon Burroughs uh, is dead. He was a judge in the uh, Westchester Supreme Court and a very bad judge. Uh, the Supreme Court of the United States uh, has uh, 
denied Glendora's petition for writ of certiorari on Glendora versus Elizabeth Hubbard, Michelle Mayapath, the Fund for Modern Courts, and Alan Beck, a sham court reform organization. The uh, Lincoln, the 1980 Lincoln, has gone 229,000 miles. Going through this think drawer and uh, catching up on the things that I should have told you about, that the FBI director is accused of mishaps, mishaps and that's uh, Louis J. Free, F-R-E-E-H. And he was a judge in Lewisboro, New York, just north of White Plains. And up there, a chat with Glendora is seen in Yorktown, Cablevision, and also Cross River, which was bought by Cablevision. And so the new director of the FBI it comes from Lewisboro, New York, a little tiny town up here in northern Westchester, uh, is now the director of the FBI. And I have sent to Mr. Free, F-R-E-E-H, uh, everything about the Bruiser Ken incident and about the uh, FBI ambush. I've sent it all to him. Uh, 78 days to a new Hempstead. It has to redistrict because the people are complaining that it discriminates against the black voters. <coughs> Excuse me, I have two colds. I have a cold that started two weeks ago down here, worked itself down, worked itself out, and a new cold that started over here. So that's quite a distinction to have two colds. Times about Rupert Murder having a great big satellite dish and the, uh, excuse me, a great big satellite deal uh, and company uh, that's going to be very serious to the cable TV operators. Let's hope that the cable TV operators have met their uh, challenge. So you have to worry about satellite though because I don't think they have public access. And now I got to talk to you people about rent control, and uh, this is a publication, The Tenants and Neighbor, and it's a tenant and neighbor, well, it's a tenant association to fight the greedy landlords, and uh, this uh, association maintains that Bruno, who wants to get rid of rent control for the greedy landlords, and other Republicans received over $700,000 in donations from landlords. Uh, and you and I, uh, if you're a tenant, uh, you and I don't have any money to make donations. And so that's who's running Albany. Uh, a lot of things go on in Albany that are bad. This one right here to get rid of rent control and help the greedy landlords. But then Albany helped the greedy insurance companies by making us carry insurance. Whether we've had an accident or not, we have to carry insurance and put out that money every uh, year. Uh, another greedy thing is this inspection of automobiles, the emissions test. Uh, and so who goes up there and lobbies for these? Okay, the people who are going to get the money. Uh, the legislature up in Albany is not fair to us. Here, uh, the law of 1970, Organized Crime Control Act of 1970, the Congress finds that one organized crime in the United States is a highly sophisticated, diversified, and widespread activity that annually drains billions of dollars from America's economy by unlawful conduct and the illegal use of force, fraud, and corruption. Two, organized crime derives a major portion of its power through money obtained from such illegal endeavors as syndicated gambling, loan sharking, the theft and fencing of property, the importation and distribution of narcotics and other dangerous drugs and other forms of social exploitation. Three, this money and power are increasingly used to infiltrate and corrupt legitimate businesses and labor unions and to subvert and corrupt our democratic processes. You think that I'm reading about organized crime, but it sounds to me like I'm reading about lawyers and judges. This is all the thing that lawyers and judges do. So this is the RICO Act, okay? The RICO Act of 1970. So I'm reading a little bit of that, and I thought I'd pass on that information to you. 
property for public access producers and anybody else who wants to come. It'll be at the Oak Beach Inn, March the 22nd at 1 p.m. Bring a dish of food. Uh, the United States Court of Appeals, Southern District of New York, uh, okayed a phony and fraudulent and lying um, bill of costs by crooked lawyer Robert Callagy, charging up to something like, uh, gee, I've forgotten what the amount was. Uh, bill of costs, you see in the United States Second Circuit, you don't get uh, a uh, attorney's fees, but it, they make uh, the person who uh, pay for the uh, cost of printing the other side's briefs. And so he staggered this and packed it all up. It went up to several hundred dollars and it's all crooked. And uh, I told him that it was crooked and showed him that he showed no proof. He had no receipts, you know, of any of this. And, uh, but the Second Circuit is great for this, uh, being crooked uh, and dishonest and deceitful. And so they gave it to him, this bill of cost, which of course he'll never be able to collect because I'm in form of paupers, I don't have any money. Uh, and uh, so I wrote them and protested it and they won't read it. And so I had to write him another motion. I say, this is my motion, is for you to read it. I'm not asking you to deny it because you've already denied it. And so this is what they send back to me, uh, that the It is hereby ordered uh, that the motion is treated as one for reconsideration and is denied. They won't even read my protest to it. Isn't this great? This is a United States court, a federal court. They are ruining our country, folks. We've got to get rid of them. They are ruining our country. We've got to get rid of these judges and get good people in there. This is outrageous. I love Steve Laurie. Steve Laurie is out in Riverhead and he is a one very fine person.
for what happened the week of uh, March the 10th. This is the week of St. Patrick's Day, and this is what happened the week of March the 10th. Vision derivative action suit where the stockbrokers ran off with $2 million and Cablevision didn't lift a finger to get it back. Uh, Judge Stein has denied my motion uh, for Rule 60B for relief from his order settling the case. It should all be brought out in the open before you. And uh, so now that means that I can appeal the case. I can appeal his decision. Last accounting I gave you was about a month ago, and I haven't had time to add up the dollars and the hours for about a month. But I am saying that Cablevision uh, lying, Dola Tata Quinn, Dolan Tata Quinn has cost me in print postage rip-off court stenography fees about $9,200. Uh, about 4,300 hours of our lives. Uh, 49 volumes, five file drawers full. 16,000 pages of law-breaking, lying, and covering up by Dolan Tata Quinn. Three years, three months, 370 mailings. Uh, 322 or so TV reports. These are the Dolan damages to Glendora. You know that Nathan Hale was murdered in Huntington? Uh, George Washington wanted to know the strength of the British troops in Long Island, and uh, Nathan Hale volunteered to go. He's from Coventry, Connecticut, and he went to Yale University. And uh, so Nathan Hale volunteered to go, and they took him out on a ship, and they dropped him off at Huntington. They said they'd pick him up in a day and a half. And so he uh, got the information, and uh, the ship came and picked him up, and it was a British ship. And he was shot. He was murdered in Huntington. The man who said, I regret that I have but one life to live for my country. I have a number of grievances to file against judges, uh, Judge Connor, Judge Bryant, Judge Rakoff, Judge Jones, and against uh, sleazy lawyers, Ben Wiles, uh, Joshua Koenig, Paul Rapp, uh, Bertram Pickell, Ian Salisbury, and certainly Robert Kelly. I've already found one, but they swept it under the rug, filed one, and of course, uh, a grievance against uh, Lisa Margaret Smith. This do not include the utility bills and the office rent. See how the lawyers are eating up the will of uh, Doris Duke, uh, not accomplishing the charities that she wanted to accomplish. So they see that money and their little old eyes just pop with the dollar signs and they can't do anything but steal that money away from the people that Doris Duke wanted it left to. Greedy, grubby liars. What did Shakespeare say? The first thing, kill the liars. To chat with Glendora, this is program 2,299. The next one is going to be number 2,300. What does that mean? It means 2,300, a chat with Glendora's. A chat with Glendora, 2,300 programs since 1970. Two, three, when public access first began. Uh, there was a phone call in the maternity ward, and an excited man said, this is Charles Patterson, and my wife's about to have a baby, and I'm bringing her in right away. And the nurse says, calm down, calm down. Is this her first baby? He says, no, I told you, this is Charles Patterson. And Gregory says that a good husband is like wine, he gets better with age, and his wife said, if I'd known that, I would have kept him in the cellar. And Charlene was married to a banker, an actor, a minister, and an undertaker. First she was married to a banker, then she married an actor, and then she married a minister, and then she married an undertaker, and that is. One for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. And Alice and Arthur couldn't afford to go to Niagara Falls for their honeymoon, so they went to the car wash instead. I am reporting to you on the law breaking off. 
another cable television crook. His name is Amos B. Hostetter. And this is in the United States District Court, Southern District of New York, Lindora Plaintiff against Amos B. Hostetter. And before I read you that, I'll report to you on the short one. And the short one is the same uh, group of cable TV crooks, Hostetter, DeLorme, and Schlaer, and Hawthorne, and all those people. But this one is going to the United States Supreme Court. There isn't anything to read to you here. This is uh, uh, 10 pages of procedure. And then there's 40 pages of argument. And then there's the informa pauperis. And there's all of the crooked and unjust decisions in the courts below. So uh, that is going out today to the United States courts. It is a petition for writ of certiorari. And what does that mean, folks? That simply means that you're asking the United States Supreme Court to ask the United States Court of Appeals to send up the record. <coughs> That's all you're asking for. And of course, the United States Supreme Court uh, isn't doing its job. 99% of these things they just deny. But I am going to read you now the report and recommendation of one magistrate, Lisa Margaret Smith, on Glendora versus Hostetter. And this was a motion by the crooked lawyer, Thomas E. Waltz II, for a summary judgment to get rid of Glendora's case. And I guess the rest speaks to itself. And a magistrate cannot make a decision on a dispositive motion. An Article III judge has to do that. An Article III of the Constitution of the United States. And so the magistrate makes a report and recommendation to the Article III judge. And then the Article III judge makes the decision as to whether to do it. Well, there's a lot wrong with that system, and this paper is going to bring that to you. One, this report and recommendation was received by Glendora on March the 5th, 1997, Wednesday, Anno Domini. It was due on or before September the 15th, 1996, and it is six months late. Excuse me, I have two colds. Or Southern District of New York has a rule. If a judge does not rule on a motion in 60 days after it is fully submitted, then the judge has to report it. While there was no report made in all this time, the motion was fully submitted on Independence Day 1996. I read it to you. You're fully familiar with it. 60 days is September the 4th, 1996, and no report was made in September, October, November, December of 1996. And no report was made in January, February of 1997. Excuse me, please. I had to start asking somebody every week for the report and recommendation. And every other week, out of these tardy six months equals 12 weeks, Glendora's free speech was violated. Also, her constitutionally secured free press. Also, her statutory right, 47 United States Code 521, at sequitur to first come and first serve. Also, her statutory right to freedom from cable operator, editorial control, and more. And this is traitorship to America. Plaintiff brings his civil actions pursuant to 42 of the United States Code, sections 1983 and 1981, and 47 of the United States Code 531E alleging deprivation of her civil rights in contravention of the First and Fourteenth Amendments of the Constitution and alleging improper editorial control in violation of the Cable Communications Policy Act of 1984 and amended and supplemented by, as amended and as supplemented by the Cable Television Consumer Protection and Competition Act of 1992 codified at Title 47 of the United States Code 521 at Sequitur. Here and after, call the Cable Act. This is a slick summary, says Glendora. It's nice to have a judge read a complaint. Smith, the complaint purports to be filed as a class action. No class action has ever been specif specifically identified or certified 
see Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 23, and you and I know that because you and I are reading the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure for the second time, and I am up for the second time to Rule 45. If colleges cannot teach lawyers and judges to write coherent papers without disjointed footnotes, then law schools should. A judge and a lawyer cannot write a cohesive, coherent paper. It all has to be littered by disjointed footnotes. And if you can't think straight when you write a paper, how do you think straight to make a decision? No class has been specifically identified, says Glendora. The class has been specified. In every public act, it is every public access producer in America. This is a class action for every public access producer in America. And this is judge error, not to know that. No class has been certified because Barrington Parker and Margaret Smith don't do their work and get their job done. This action was filed in August of 1995, one and a half years ago. Actually, one year, eight months. What happened to the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure? Rule one, just, speedy, and inexpensive. It went the same way the 60-day rule went. Judges and lawyers break more rules than any crook. Now here comes another. The complaint, first of all, the complaint asserts seven causes of action, including several pendant state actions, Smith writes. Now here comes another footnote, another disjointed footnote. If judges cannot write without disjointed footnotes, how can they think about being without being disjointed? The first and second claims invoke the first and fourteenth amendments, alleging abridgment of plaintiff's freedom of speech impressed by cancellation of plaintiff's weekly program. The third and fourth claims invoke 47 United States Code, Section 531 of the Cable Act, and 42 of the U.S. Code, Double Section 1981 and 1983. And the fifth claim asserts a private cause of action under 47 U.S. Code 531E. First, under principles of pendant jurisdiction, the complaint also seeks relief for a common law claim of intentional infliction of emotional distress, that's claim six, and for damage to plaintiff's reputation, that's claim seven, and the complaint's ad dominum clause seeks $298 million in compensatory and punitive damages, along with the cost of the action. Uh, the restoration of plaintiff's cable program to every Saturday on channels 19 South and North. This is Judge Era. My complaint does not request restoration to channel 19 North. That's a whole post-complaint situation that cable, uh, Continental Cable TV uh, knew that they were guilty, knew that they were wrong, and tried to get out of it by also putting the program on Channel 19 North. So this is Judge Era. I did not seek restoration of the program every week on Channel 19 North. Only on Channel 19 South where it was. And never should have been taken off every other week. Plaintiff seeks a permanent injunction in guaranteeing that time slot and a demand that defendants make good any programs that they miss at 3 p.m. Saturdays on Channel 19 by cable casting the same Channel 19 either on a weekend afternoon or in prime time, 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. So the court shows undue influence by the defendants and is brainwashed. This is a significant point. I never said restoration on Channel 19 South. Please read the complaint again. It says to put Glendora's program back on TV every Saturday at 3 p.m. where it always had been. The complaint does not mention Channel 19 North. A chat with Glendora had been on Channel 19 South every Saturday at 3 p.m. Why shouldn't it stay there? Judge Smith is not doing a good job telling what happened. Glendora's program was on Channel 19 South since December 1993, every Saturday at 3 p.m. In ignorance and arrogance, Hostetter et al. took her program off every other Saturday and put in its place the Vince Martell Show. One at Sequitur is violated. Immediately, Glendora's federal statutory rights are violated. Her right to first come, first serve is robbed. Her right to freedom from cable TV operator editorial control is robbed. You can't take off one show and put another in its place without exercising editorial control, can you folks? 
You see, Judge Smith's taking an inordinate amount of time to do her job has forgotten the case. For a decision that took eight months, one expects fully familiar with the facts and circumstances. Glendora is allowed 10 days to oppose a uh, report and recommendation. At the factor that stated above, Glendora should get eight times 10, which is 80 days, because it took her eight months to make this decision. The rest of disjointed footnote two is accurate. Plaintiff who prefers to be known by the single name Glendora, I'm not single, I'm married is a producer of a cable program cable cast by Continental Cable Vision Incorporated hereafter Continental uh, referred as Continental on a public access channel in Westchester and Rockland counties in New York State according to the complaint many of Glendora's public access programs concern litigation in the Westchester County Supreme Court the state of New York. She reported the political manipulation by judges, the arrogance of law clerks, the abusiveness of New York state court officers, and the errors by clerks, and more. And this is accurate. Glendora filed suit in this case because Continental reduced the scheduled cable casting of her program on Continental's public access channel from every Saturday to two Saturdays per month. This, too, Glendora says, shows bias and prejudice in favor of the defendants. Defendants kept saying two Saturdays per month, but Glendora kept saying every other Saturday per month. In a month with five Saturdays, the program was on three Saturdays per month. Again, this shows the court is listening to defendants and blocking out the complainant who was injured. Here is another disjointed footnote indicating more disjointed decision making. There is some inconsistency, says Smith, between the submissions as to whether the show was originally cable cast every Saturday or four Saturdays a month. There isn't. In any event, the new schedule set forth by Continental placed plaintiff's show in the schedule on the first and third Saturdays of the month. Glendora tells you there was never any inconsistency. If you had read Glendora's papers, you would know that the show was cable cast every Saturday since it began December 1993. It should never have been touched. Defendants were wrong. Injured plaintiff and plaintiff came to you for correction of a wrong and protection of a right. In eight months, the facts and circumstances should be familiar. Yay! In one and a half years. But maybe Jim Galvin did not hand in other Glendora papers. Who is Jim Galvin? The courtroom deputy. In addition, Continental required Glendora to add a disclaimer to her program. Glendora is on 14 cable TV systems, and this is the only cable system that required this disclaimer. It was a dumb thing for the defendants to do, along with all the other dumb things that they did. Now, will you please go back to school and learn how to write a coherent paper without disjointed footnotes? How can you make a coherent decision if your thought is so disjointed? Footnote number four. Although the disclaimer requirement is mentioned several times in the complaint, it is not mentioned in any of the seven claims for relief, which primarily seek relief for cancellation of the program. So that's stupid and it's juvenile. How old was the person who wrote this report and recommendation? When, uh, Smith says, the defendants here are or were employed in various capacities, either by Continental or by American Cable Systems of New York, Incorporated here and after American Cable Systems. American Cable Systems is a wholly owned subsidiary of Continental. They are now all owned by U.S. West Telephone. Glendora is a shareholder. CEO Richard D. McCormick and media head Charles Lillis are in violation of New York State Business Corporation law written by Nelson Rockefeller, Article 7 and 13, subject of the next lawsuit. 28. Smith Robinson that because of the cancellation of Glendora's weekly series, uh, her freedom of speech rights and her right to be free from editorial control have been violated. You and I are on page nine. Well, this is so, says Glendora, and it should not be taking this court one and a half years to give plaintiffs the relief that she is entitled to. Wright Smith, Magistrate Lisa Margaret Smith. Defendants maintain that they scheduled plaintiff's program to be aired for only two time slots per month. Well, you don't air cable shows, okay? They never hit the air. That's for broadcast. This is Cablecast TV, the signal goes through electrical cable. How can a judge make a decision if a judge is pro se about television? 
Pandora's has violated here and now. The defendant's violated all the rights Pandora has set. For his come for serve and proper restraint of speech, free speech, free press, the public's right to know. Your right to know. And First Amendment and 14th and cable TV editorial control at all. Dwight Smith, in order to permit other producers of cable programs to have access to their community cable station. Pandora says, but this is not the law. There is no law that says this. Defendants broke the law first time, first serve. That's the law. Says Smith, they also assert that other producers of public access programs were treated identically to Glendora. Glendora says, how does this absolve defendants of violated of Glendora's rights? It only makes defendants worse law breakers. Smith, the gravamen of plaintiff's complaint is that the reduction of the number of allocated time slots for plaintiff's program from four times per month to two times per month. And Glendora says, well, doesn't it? Obviously. And get it straight, it is not from four times a month to two times a month, it is from every week to every other week. A chat with Glendora had been on the Continental System every Saturday since December 1993. And here is more disjointed thinking and another footnote, and this is footnote number five. Smith, during the pendency of this case, defendants informed the court that they expected the channel capacity for the area service to increase in the fall of 1996, at which point Continental would have sufficient channel capacity to accommodate all existing producers of cable programs and to return plaintiff's program to four time slots per month. She still can't get it straight. For as long as there was sufficient ca channel capacity to accommodate prospective producers of public access cable programs. And Glendora wants to know, so why didn't they wait? and keep themselves from violating the laws this court is here to enforce. They acted in arrogance and ignorance. The court long ago should have done its duty and stopped them and made them pay. Says so Smith, it's tantamount to the exercising of editorial control over her program. Well, of course it is, obviously. Smith, Plaintiff also claims that the action was taken because Westchester officials have exerted official pressure on the cable operator to censor her program. And Glendora says, why can't Judge Parker simply read the complaint? Why do we have to spend all this time reading it to him? Can't an Article judge, an Article III judge read a complaint? This is a very dull paper so far, says Glendora. And we are up to page 10. Says Smith, for the reasons set forth here, and I respectfully recommend that all but the second claim for relief should be dismissed personally. To defendant's motion for summary judgment, and that as to the second claim for relief, it should be dismissed as to defendants Hostetter, Nair, Ritter, Hawthorne, DeLorme, and Schleyer. This is a double cross, says Condor. Lisa Margaret Smith is on record as saying there was improper restraint of speech. She has been in error several times in this case. She has been biased and prejudiced repeatedly in this case. She has, a, she has in open court shown her solicitude of her fellow Rockland County friends, sympathizing openly in court with Thomas Walt Friday night, 5 p.m. trips over the Tappan Zee Bridge. My whole staff, quote unquote, is on your side on that one, Mr. Walt, said Lisa Margaret Smith. Jim Galvin, her courtroom deputy, was blatantly in full view in broad daylight on the side of Thomas Walsh, to the extent of withholding a Glendora paper from the view of Magistrate Smith. When Glendora faced both Galvin and Smith in open court with what they had done and refused to let them cover up, Smith stormed off of the bench in a temper fit and in fierce anger stated, this court is adjourned. Walsh stole another two weeks and Glendora's rights were violated that much longer. Meanwhile, America, the Constitution, and Congress are betrayed. The temper fit will be part of Glendora's Title 28 United States Code, Section 372C, Grievance against Lisa Margaret Smith. 
Glendora will address the bias and prejudice in greater depth later in this paper. Meanwhile, we return to scrutiny of page four by Lisa Margaret Smith. Summary of the procedural history, writes Smith. On August 23, 1995, plaintiff filed her complaint. On August 24, 1995, plaintiff filed an amended complaint. On September 18, 1995, an answer was filed on behalf of all the named defendants except American Cable Systems, which was added to the case on plaintiff's motion on January 5, 1996, and Michael Ritter. Michael Ritter was a defendant from the beginning, says Glendora. Here is more disjointed think, uh, thinking, footnote number six. All of the correspondence and documentation, Wright Smith, received by Glendora in connection with her cable cast, identified the cable caster as Continental. However, Continental claims to do business under another corporate name, American Cable Systems. Initially, Continental moved to dismiss the complaint on the ground, among other things, that the complaint failed to name an indispensable party, American Cable Systems. In an oral report and recommendation to your Honor on January 5, 1996, I recommended in part that the motion to dismiss on that ground should be denied. That's Ginny. She's building a nest. She gets in the copy paper boxes, the errands boxes. That means also she wants her lunch. I recommended in part to Smith that the motion to dismiss on that ground should be denied. I also granted plaintiff's application to add American Cable Systems and deemed the complaint to be so amended. Your Honor, accepting my report and recommendation by order, uh, dated February 20th, 1996. Thank you, says Glendora. Mr. Walsh was desperate trying to...
in a case such as this one, but I have not decided that issue. But yet she goes ahead and gets rid of the case on a summary judgment. So where does this leave us on the issue, Glendora wants to know. Hmm. Pages are affectionate, they're stuck on each other. Right, Smith? Subsequently, the parties engaged in a limited amount of discovery in order to explore the possible basis for jurisdiction over certain of the individual's defendants. That was not what the discovery was about at all. The discovery was about who made the decision. United States Magistrate Judge Smith says Glendora stayed discovery on a motion for summary judgment. She never should have done that. USMJ Fox does not do that, but USMJ had to help her Rockland County soulmate uh, through Rockland County, James Galvin, who can make USMJ Smith do anything he wants. It was obvious to Franklin and Glendora what was going on. Walsh tries to win by manipulating law clerks and other clerks because he has no meritorious defense. Walsh has no meritorious defense. It is the same devious way he manipulated Allison Van Horn, who got Barrington D. Parker, to do a vaulty facey on Glendora's motion for preliminary injunction and temporary restraining order. It is all so sad, and it is all such an abuse of America. Wright Smith, after this initial discovery was completed and after hearing argument on the propriety of permitting a dispositive motion, and Glendora says to that, the discovery was not completed. United States Magistrate Judge let Mr. Walsh get by with one lie and one cover-up after another, nearly 100 of them, and Glendora was shut out by United States Magistrate Judge Smith. It was grotesquely biased. Glendora's reasons against summary judgment are valid. Mr. Walsh's uh, four are vapid. Glendora says, but Rockland County buddy ship has to win. Glendora made a 70-page motion in affirmation for sanctions on the lies perpetrated by Mr. Walsh and the cover-up defendants, and USMJ ignored Smith, ignored it entirely. To this day, Glendora has never received an answer. The plan clearly was and is to protect Mr. Walsh. Wright Smith, I granted defendants' request to file a motion for summary judgment and a motion to dismiss on certain grounds. I also set a set schedule for the submissions of the parties. No permission was granted to the plaintiff to file a cross motion. Glendora, of course not. By now, the fix is in. By now, the fix is in. Here's half of a whole page of disjointed footnotes. Wright Smith, on January 5, 1996, I recommended in my oral report and recommendation that your order should deny the motion to dismiss on the ground of lack of jurisdiction against certain individual defendants because plaintiff had not had an opportunity to explore the possible facts underlying such jurisdiction. Wright Smith, although defense counsel did not initially represent Michael J. Ritter of American Cable Systems, counsel subsequently informed the court that he would be representing these defendants along with the other defendants. Glendora. Along with much more permissiveness did Mr. Walsh get by because of his Rockland County buddyship with Mr. James Galvin, who has the sway. Smith. On July 3, 1996, defendants filed a motion for summary judgment for the entire complaint or, in the alternative, a motion to dismiss as defendants Hostetter, Nair, Ritter, Hawthorne, DeLorme, Schleyer, here and after collectively referred to as the Boston defendants and Douglas Guthrie for lack of personal jurisdiction. On July 12, 1996, plaintiff filed her response and entitled it cross motion, although, and then Glendora says, stop everything. Here's another disjointed footnote. Smith, the response consists of 139 pages, that's Glendora, of diatribe and invective stating with the words, starting with the words, you are traitors to your country. Why is that diatribe and invective? That is the truth. Cross motion at page one, plaintiff accuses defense counsel, myself, my courtroom deputy, your owner, and your former law clerk of being traitors to our country. She accuses defense counsel of making crooked, frivolous, lying motions and of being sly and devious. She accuses your owner of violating an act of Congress by denying plaintiff's motion for a preliminary injunction in an inept, unjust, and un-American decision. What's wrong with that? That's exactly what happened. Free speech or not free speech? Glendora 
Moore purports to refute defendant's statement of facts and supporting affirmations at pages 17 to 31 and so forth. However, although she accuses defense counsel of being repetitious and making false statements, she does not present any contrary facts either by affidavit or by attached exhibits, rather that she simply repeatedly restates the claims from her complaint and arguments. There's so many footnotes here, you can't possibly make it contiguous. So Glendor, let me interject here. They cut their record. It's not my fault that they're traitors to their country. They cut their own record. Glendora did not cut it. Their record stands. And this is a lie. Glendora did. Pages and pages were presented. The bias and prejudice of the United States magistrate judge has run away with her. Glendora is glad to have this proof in her own hand. Notice how quickly United States Magistrate Judge Smith runs to defense of counsel defense, to the defense of the counsel defense. Notice the immediate solicitude, and we will read you more next week. On the law breaking of John C. Malone, Bob Magnus, Telecommunications Incorporated, and the rest of the accomplices, uh, Marshall and Vieira, and Neil said to his wife, honey, you look the same as you did the day we were married, 25 years ago. And she said, I should, I'm wearing the same dress. And, uh, Let's see what else I can find you. That's a good one. Oh yeah, on a card in front of a house was a sign that said drum set for sale. And on a card in front of the house next door was a sign that said hooray! And Bill says he has a photographic uh, memory. Uh, and his wife says yes, but sometimes he forgets to take off the lens cap. And the high school orchestra is really improving, folks. You can tell now when they're through warming up. I truly don't know where I left off reporting to you on the law-breaking lying and covering up of John C. Malone, Bob Magnus, telecommunications at all, and the downfall of the United States district judges on that matter. But here on March 1st is a notice of motion that United States District Judge Barbara S. Jones recuse herself. Did I read that to you or didn't I? Uh, and all of the reasons that she should are true today. And she got in a, an order finally by my pressing her, the clerk, and telling her, because she will wait forever, Barbara S. Jones, she just doesn't do her work. She isn't qualified to be a United States District Judge by any stretch of the American um, imagination. She is D'Amato's friend, and that's how she got to be a judge, and she's just totally incompetent. Uh, so anyway, she denied the order. And all of her strings are pulled by D'Amato and by Connor and probably by other judges. Anyway, she got bumped down to White Plains. Rakoff fled and went to Manhattan with Kim and Kin. And uh, so standing before Judge Fox is a, uh, my motion for summary judgment because these defendants have no defense and never will have any defense. Uh, they took away our editing in White Plains, and you can't edit a TV program, public access, unless you have editing. And you can't uh, be on the television unless you can hand in a program, and you can't hand in a program unless you have a place to edit it. And so therefore, you aren't, you're not on TV, and therefore your free speech and your free press is violated. Your free press, your right to know what's going on. Because we report things to you that nobody else will report. Uh, we have here, now did you read this one? No, that's an old one, that's just a uh, refund. At the last count, which was a long time ago, the last week of February, and I'm going to uh, estimate it now. 
let's see, this is on uh, February 24th, so we have the week of March 3rd, the week of March 10th, and today is uh, St. Patrick's Day, so that'll be two weeks. I say that the lying, law-breaking, and cover-up of John C. Malone, Bob Magnus, Telecommunications Incorporated, and the lawyers, and the corrupt judges, have cost us $5,200. That's half of $10,000 in printing, postage, and rip-off court stenographer fees. I tell you that they have cost us 2,400 hours. And if you multiply 2,400 hours by $250 an hour, which is what these rip-off lawyers, monopoly, and antitrust why are they allowed to exist? What they get, $250 an hour times uh, 20, 300, 2,400 hours comes out to something like $600,000 in legal labor we have done. That's over a half a million dollars. We've got to get rid of lawyers. We've got to get good judges. And 130 seven chapters on TV of Malone Magnus TCI law breaking, lying and covering up, and also the lying and covering up of the lawyers and the judges. Uh, approximately 205 mailings, 39 volumes. This is number 39 to the end of February. I haven't had a chance to start volume 40, which would start with March 1st and about 13,000 pages of lying, covering up, and law-breaking, not only of the lawbreakers, Malone, Magnus, and TCI at all, but of the lawyers and of the judges. Four file drawers of Malone, Magnus, TCI traitorship to America and murder of public access. Now, the TCI had a meeting on March 12th, and Malone's trying to raise money. He's done a lousy job running the company. The money's gone into his pocket and that and the pockets of his accomplices. It has not gone to the shareholders. The shareholders are mad. The stock has dropped from 19 to 13. Uh, and he's trying to raise money desperately. And so uh, on March the 12th, Wednesday, he had a meeting in Denver to try to get the shareholders to approve a plan to sell off TCI Satellite and come up with a new offering on the New York Stock Exchange. I wanted to go to that meeting, and this is what I would said, John Malone, you are a traitor to your country, you have murdered free speech, and you've murdered public access, and you've murdered free press, and you have lied all the way through it. But it takes money to go to Denver, Colorado, and certainly it takes time, and I cannot leave these uh, lawsuits. Remember the motion made by crooked Bertram Perkle, who works for Baker and Botts, to whom TCI paid $10 million last in 1995, it would be, yes, 1995 in lawyer's fees. Okay, Bertram Perkle uh, wanted to combine uh, the appeals on the lousy, rotten traitorship decision of Jed S. Rakoff on Glendora versus Malone, and combine that with the impossibly schoolgirl uh, and deceitful and devious order of Barbara S. Jones wanted uh, Glendora versus telecommunication. The first one was for robbing us of public access channel eight. The second one was for the out and out censorship, uh, turning off the audio while Glendora was reporting on cable TV. Uh, William C. Connor caught red-handed in ex parte. And he was talking to me on the telephone. I recorded that telephone conversation. I videotaped it, and it was being played on TCI on April 30th, 1996. And TCI turned down, turned off the audience. Out and out censorship. Okay, Barbara Jones says it's okay. Censorship is alive and well in America. You can censor anybody you want in America. We don't have a constitution, we don't have any statutes, we don't have any tradition of freedom of speech. We can censor. You just go right ahead and censor. An idiotic decision, Barbara S. Jones. Uh, so that is, uh, Perkle wants to consolidate those two cases. Why? Because he doesn't have a defense in either one of them. 
and we get a snitty letter from him over the weekend uh, saying something about how I submitted an appellant's brief and uh, exhibits to the appellant's brief. Well, and he thinks there's something wrong with that. I have done 15 appeals in the United States Court of Appeals and every one of them has been done exactly that way. And they have all gone through. Now this uh, amateur, Perkle, who can't even write, he doesn't even know enough to use their motion form, a T1080 motion form. Uh, so he writes and demands me to make it clear to him what I'm going to do. Well, what I'm going to do is to tell him that you don't have any meritorious defense in the first place, and if you knew anything about the U.S. Court of Appeals, you know there's nothing wrong. What's wrong is wrong with you, and you made a mess of this since you started, and I'll send a copy to John C. Malone. Uh, what else happened? Let's see, there was Jones. Uh, I will certainly appeal that order. I'll call up, first of all, the pro se court and see if you can appeal an order like that. And if you can, I certainly will. And then I'll just tell Perkle off. And then there was a, seems to me like there was a third paper. It came in over the weekend. Oh, no. That was a Continental paper, and I forgot to tell the people Continental about that. I should write a motion to uh, uh, Magistrate Fox uh, that uh, Westchester PCI should be admitted as a uh, defendant. Maybe I won't, maybe I won't, because they're trying, they have no defense at all, you know, they broke the law. And so they're trying to uh, uh, get a dismissal on a fluke what you call a procedural uh, thing because they have no defense and these judges don't know enough to rule on the merits or, and they break every law that Congress made about ruling on the merits, ruling on the law, and ruling on the facts. And uh, I have certainly have a right to a jury trial. Uh, they are so corrupt, these judges. You, you know, we've been complaining about lawyers, but the judges are just as bad or worse than the lawyers. Well, let's see, and about Ben Wiles and the minutes, I don't think there's any more point in reading more minutes to you. You've already got uh, a clear idea of uh, how crooked he is and what a liar he is and what a thief and what a cheat he is. And I want to file a grievance against him and against Perkle and against Jones and against Rakoff uh, that would be Title 28, 372C, uh, mental instability, uh, interfering with the business of the courts. I'd like to know what has happened to uh, Time Warner versus the city of New York, if there's any decision on that appeal. Uh, Newcomb has that. Uh, so where do we stand now? Fox waiting for a report and recommendation. Of course he's going to dismiss it, find any way he possibly can to dismiss it and rob me of my rights that I, uh, in addition to the rights that uh, Crooked Malone robbed us of. Uh, dismiss the case. Uh, and then down in the United States Court of Appeals is the appeal of Glendora versus Malone, which was taking, robbing us of Channel 8 and the same, and putting commercials on, taking a public access channel and putting commercials on it. Uh, that's the same thing that's in the time for the United States Court of Appeal and Time Warner versus New York City. Um, Glendora versus uh, telecommunications, which is the out and out censorship of a program by turning down the audio because uh, TCI Malone and Connor uh, did not want uh, the, you to know uh, what Connor said and did not want you to know about the law-breaking lying and covering up of Malone, Magnus, and TCI and of the lawyers and of the judges. See, they're trying to keep all this information from you. Censorship is alive and well in America. And the uh, 
So that's it. We have a TCI in the United States Court of Appeals on one case and on another case, and we have TCI in the United States District Court uh, on another case. Uh, Brian Sussman, uh, Bryant uh, dismissed uh, Sussman's case. Bryant did another lousy job. Uh, the man is too old. He should retire. He should have retired long ago. Uh, Bryant wrote. Brian Sussman wrote an excellent uh, paper on uh, Rule 59E for Judge Charles L. Bryant to uh, amend or alter uh, his decision to dismiss. And that is worth reading. Some of that is worth reading to you. A notice of a motion uh, written by uh, Sussman along about the... Uh, the first week of March, Monday the 3rd, person to Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, uh, 59E, and altered or amended judgment, reversing dismissal by recognizing plaintiff's explicit private right to cause of action, person to Title 47, the United States Code 532B.6, explicitly by 47 U.S. Code Section 532D, and implicitly by 47 United States Code 545A.1.A, .A, and 47 U.S. Code Section 545E, and together with such other and further relief as this court may deem just and proper. Uh, he puts together a very good motion. Uh, Bryant Sussman is really a genius. He is so far ahead, whole head and shoulders, over the judge, Bryant, and over the lawyer, uh, Kernan. Brian Sussman is plaintiff in the above entitled action, but not an attorney, does respectively allege and affirm within time limits that the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 59E motion is properly made for this court to alter an amended summary judgment in order and for this court to revive the amended complaint based on its cause of action not previously challenged by defendant and nor considered by this court. I want to know the truth. Brian ruled on the original complaint instead of the amended complaint. Plaintiff moves for this court to declare that the amended complaint does contain a valid private right to cause of action regarding plaintiff's grievances pursuant to 47 U.S. Code Section 532b6 based on the private right to cause of action that all agreed persons explicitly have from 47 U.S. Code Section 532d. Plaintiff's cause of action pursuant to 47 U.S. Code Section 532b6 via 5 532D was not part of the original complaint, but was part of the amended complaint and its accompanying memorandum of law, and was referred to in plaintiff's other supporting papers. Kernig is such a terrible lawyer. Defendant's motion to dismiss only challenged the implied cause of action from 47 U.S. Code 532B, D, based on 47531E for censorship of public access. However, defendant's motion to dismiss failed to challenge the explicit cause of action from 47 U.S. Code 532D based on 47532B.6 for unlawful cable casting of third-party commercial programming on an existing public access channel. We had public access on Channel 8. And TCI came along and took away our public access programming and put commercials on there instead commercials for Playboy and for uh, their dirty movies and for what else do they advertise on there? And this court also failed to address that explicit cause of action of 47 U.S. Code 532D based on 47 U.S. Code 532B.6. This court should uh, revive the amended complaint and permit discovery and trial, or alternatively, make a summary judgment and order TCI to remove all third-party commercial programming from Channel 8, including the present programming on said channel, and for defendant TCI Cable of Westchester to cease all future attempts at cable casting commercial programming on Channel 8, which was our public access uh, channel. Additionally, the defendant failed to challenge, and this court failed to address, defendant TCI's obvious violations of Title 47 U.S. Code 545, A.1.A, and of 47 U.S. Code Section 545E. Therefore, plaintiff Brian Sussman moves for this court to address 
47 U.S. Code 532D as it relates to Section 532B.6 and moves for this court to address the clear violations of Title 47 U.S. Code 545A.1.A and 545E by TCI and perhaps by its franchisors. Therefore, plaintiff moves for this court to reverse itself and revive the amended complaint and to permit the amended complaint to proceed toward discovery and trial. Never in the world will Bryant be able to follow this. Judge Bryant, he will not be able to follow this. He doesn't know the law. And so, uh, quotations from the amended complaint. And since uh, Bryant ignored the amended complaint, uh, Sussman goes through and uh, tells it to him again. I'm sorry, folks, I have two colds. Did you ever have two colds at the same time? One cold started down here 10 days ago, worked itself down, then worked itself up to about here. And then two days ago, another one started up here. So Bryant uh, Sussman is brilliant. He's head and shoulders above uh, the judge and above the lawyers, and he's a pro se. I told you about Wow's minutes. It's not worth any more reading any more of them to you. You have got your conclusion by now. He lies, he steals, he cheats. And there is nothing so simple that Wiles cannot make it difficult. And he's pro se about television. That is Ben Wiles. We have an atrocious record from the Judge Rakoff court of uh, Mr. Ken, who did a terrible job on a telephone conference. And they lied and they covered up. And eventually, Jed S. Rakoff ran to Manhattan. So stay down there.
simple that Wiles cannot make it difficult. And he's pro se about television. That is Ben Wiles. We have an atrocious record from the Judge Rakoff court of uh, Mr. Ken, who did a terrible job on a telephone conference. And they lied and they covered up. And eventually, Judge S. Rakoff ran to Manhattan. So stay down there. Uh, we also have a terrible tape of uh, Judge Cabranes. Uh, he's a uh, United States appellate judge uh, from Connecticut, Connecticut, and he was on the uh, Judicial Conference of the United States. He was, and I called up to see if he still is. And these people are dehumanized. They won't answer a question. They're devious. They run away. Uh, they cover up. They are a sad, sad, uh, discredit to their country, the United States of America. For our folks, you don't get time to think about something, so you put it in a drawer, and as soon as you can, you open the drawer and think about it. But I did jot down some thoughts for you. And uh, I was behind on my think drawer 18 days. But over the weekend, I was able to uh, get it all up to date and read the things that uh, had to be put aside. You know that I am cable TV operator free. I canceled my subscription to Telecommunications Incorporated. I have a converter box uh, that I am going to give away. This is public access and you can't sell anything. So I am going to give it away to the person who writes the best essay about a chat with Glendora. The box is worth $107, and you must not pay TCI $3 a month for a converter box when you can own your own. That's an out-and-out ripoff, such as the telephone company pulled for decades. Uh, the uh, city of New York, the judges are going to get annual reviews. Every judge we have should have an annual review, but they should be reviewed by us, not collusive lawyers, okay, not their bodies. Uh, looking here, for, and remi remember the great decision of all time that Glendora's case cannot be dismissed because she is pro se. And she has to have the opportunity to prove beyond a doubt. Uh, that she uh, has a claim and has proof for that claim. Luther wrote the hymn, Our mighty fortresses are God, a bulwark never failing. And then he says down here, and this applies to judges, okay? For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with a cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. <clears throat> Just looking for announcements for you. I want to know why O'Rourke has quit as county supervisor. Has it got anything to do with lining him up to be a judge? How can O'Rourke be a federal judge? He's never sat on a bench in his life. What does he know? But then, all of them that are sitting on the bench, what do they know? And now you can see the genesis. What starts all this? They don't know anything. They don't have the experience. They don't have the wisdom. They don't have the maturity. I was never in a court until I was 60 years old. And I was the first in the member of my family to be in a court. But I believe what they told us in high school. And if it takes the rest of the millennium, I will fight for it. They told us in high school that if you're wrong, you go to court and you get justice. It's a lie. The courts are an industry to make as much money as they can for lawyers and for judges. Pro se's go into court and they talk circles around judges and they talk circles around lawyers. Uh, this law partner indictment shocks many. What's the story on that, folks? What's the latest on that? Paul Kramer. The federal indictment of law partners, James Lysick and Peter Kramer. What's the story on that, folks? 
Where does it stand? And here's a citation from Merrill B. Folsom, who was 94 years old and was a reporter of the, uh, for the New York Times. This, this man sounds to me like he was a wonderful man. His name is Sidney W. Dean. And uh, so long in cable systems, as cable systems can control their content, they will attempt to deny market assets, access to all other producers and distributors of print and electronic communications. This is in 1973. He wrote this letter to the New York Times. And certainly that has come up with the Rupert Murdoch case and New York and Fox News. Uh, today, Time Warner owns many of the channels on its system, and so does Cablevision, the other cable franchise holder in the city. Uh, Dean criticized the city's progress, uh, process for awarding cable television franchises as a blind man's bluff purchasing agent act in which the city was settling for too little from the cable companies, and he said that nothing in the city's franchise award plans holds any hope of cable reaching out to the poor, the ghetto, and the handicapped. Fewer than half of the households in the city subscribe to cable TV. Do you realize that, New York City? But I want you to remember this name, Sidney W. Dean. He died at 91 years old. And he was a great promoter of free speech through cable television. God bless you, Sidney Dean. Thoughts are all in tropes. This was group one, and I've uh, read you uh, those things of significance out of group one and also group two. Now let's see what's in group three. I have a sad thing to tell you. Richard Parsons, who is the uh, president of Time Warner, I talked to him. He was a 1988. In fact, he on August the 8th, 88, 8888, he was on a chat with Glendora. And uh, so I called him and I told him that Time Warner should enter the Glendora appeal as an amicus curiae because uh, the Second Circuit cannot rule against Glendora without ruling against Time Warner. And so he said to, I called him at home and I told him jokes and uh, he said to call him at his office, and I did that. And then I call him back, and he doesn't return the calls. And then I call him back at home, up in Pecanical Hills, up where the Rockefellers live, and uh, the phone is uh, not in service. Judge's pet, like you have a teacher's pet, you have a judge's pet. Here's a picture of Merrill Folsom. Uh, he was a reporter for the New York Times. He was head of the White Plains Bureau of the New York Times. He was a great writer. And so this is group uh, three. We have group four. All the other ones are read to you. Let's check uh, group four and five. Well, what's this about a convict says that he got a bribe from uh, Janine Pirro's husband? Janine Pirro's husband is certainly handsome. So is there anything more come of that? Is it the truth? Juror questionnaire. What is your full name? What is your county of residence? How long have you resided at your present residence? Have you ever served on a jury or grand jury, state, local, or federal? When? What kind of a case was it? You know, these judges are totally incapable of picking a juror that is not biased and not prejudiced because the judges are all biased and prejudiced. It's the whole thing is a farce. Okay. The box score. What do we have in the United States Supreme Court? We have Glendora versus Hostetter, Continental Cable TV. We have Glendora versus Gelman, that's in the United States Supreme Court. And Glendora versus Bryant, uh, second appeal on his uh, robbing Glendora of her right to jury trial.
What do we have in the United States Court of Appeals? Glendora versus Malone, Rakoff's stupid decision. Uh, Glendora versus Telecommunications, Jones, that says censorship is okay in America, well and alive. Uh, Glendora versus uh, Bryant, appeal number three, for robbing us of our uh, right to trial by jury the second time. Uh, Glendora versus DePaulo, Officer Stead, a White Plains policeman who said Glendora went through a red light and she didn't. It's malicious prosecution, the same old story of cops lying. Uh, what do you have in the United States District Court? Glendora versus Magnus, where Magnus robbed us of our public access TV editing. Uh, also, Glendora versus Cablevision is still there. Uh, Glendora versus the city of White Plains for that phony gas leak. They said the car leaked gas, it never leaked gas, and it was towed all the way to Hartsdale. More malicious prosecution. What do we have in the United States District Court in the Eastern District? Glendora shareholder versus uh, the board of directors of Cablevision. Uh, Glendora versus Sullivan of the uh, appellate division. Uh, the fixed court, second department in Brooklyn. The worst court we have, and that's saying a lot. Uh, and then uh, Glendora versus Bruiser, Bruiser Ken. And then there's another one uh, somewhere. Just went through my mind. There's another one some. Oh yeah, the uh, derivative action against Cablevision. And Stein uh, did not grant Glendora's Rule 60B relief from judgment. <coughs> you know what an Article III judge is, right? An Article III judge is appointed by the President of the United States for life. Okay, we're up to the last group. Okay. I think that's it. All right, that's all of the bulletins, and we're going to close with some jokes. See, the reason we have our teddy bears sitting here is that last week I wore these clothes only twice, and they weren't dirty enough to get on a new set of clothes, but I had to have a mark here so that I could tell uh, this week's programs from last week's programs. You know that you're in middle age if it takes longer to rest up than it did to get uh, tired? And you know that you're middle-aged when you're out and you're faced with two temptations and you take the one that gets you home at 9 p.m. And a midget fortune teller escaped from a jail and the headline in the newspaper said, uh, small, medium, at large. And Here's the closing Bible passage. Remember this, folks. Remember this is your strength. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Luke 11, 28. God bless you. Glendora versus the city of White Plains and that phony gas leak, the city of White Plains Police Department, the city of White Plains Fire Department. You remember the phony gas leak? There was no gas leak. And they had the car towed all the way to Hartsdale and cost us, uh, you know, something like $95. What has happened to that? Uh, it is down... It's been submitted to the United States District Court, Southern District of New York. It's down in the, uh, that court in Foley Square, waiting for the judge to sign my informa papyrus, which should be signed right away. When was that filed? It was way back in December, wasn't it? I think it was. And uh, so I'm just being stonewalled. You go to court for justice, and what do you get? Dishonesty. I haven't had time to really get down there and pound on the table and make them act like Americans. So what has happened on Glendora versus Officer Stead? 
who said that Glendora went through a red light when she didn't, which is a case of malicious prosecution, and Glendora versus Friedman, and Glendora versus DePaulo, and uh, Glendora versus Martusiello and Cahill, clerks in the appellate term. What's happening on that? Another stone wall. That's in the United States Court of Appeals, waiting for an informal papyrus. They don't move. So you go to court for justice, and what do you get? Traitorship to America. What is happening on Glendora versus Gelman, who stole two Glendora VHS, never returned them? That's in the Supreme Court of the United States. We have a landlord fight going on with John Porzio, who is a vicious man and wants to prove power. It's a whole power abuse. He's the one who spit in my face and I filed a criminal charge against him. Uh, we have a whole big fight going on there. Another greedy landlord. Don't forget, you have to put up your fight. Tenants, tenants association, and you have to fight for rent control because these greedy landlords are up there paying the politicians to pass it. So you better just make you know, yourself known and yourself heard. Uh, Charles Bryant uh, did an atrocious job on Sussman versus TCI. Uh, Sussman, he, well, Bryant ruled on the original complaint, which is moot, instead of ruling on the amended complaint. And uh, Sussman made a Rule 59E for Bryant to amend or alter. And uh, it, the return date was March the 21st, Friday. And Bryant always wants you there on a return date. And so Sussman was there. And he wasn't even on the calendar. And Sussman told P Tony Bravado uh, all this that I just told you. So give Bryant credit, at least he called Sussman to the bench. And the jerks uh, from Albany, that would be Koenig and Rapp, uh, never showed up. They did oppose the 59E motion. Bryant said, I don't want to hear it. I don't want any arguments after the decision is made. He says, you go to the United States Court of Appeals. And Sussman says, oh, I am going to the United States Court of Appeals, but I want clarifications on these things that you didn't deal with. Bryant, I'm not going to change it. I'm not going to change a thing. Go to the United States Court of Appeals. It's good for the country. Uh, Sussman mentioned the Denise Cote, Time Warner versus the New York City uh, decision, and Bryant says, I think that's going to be reversed. What does he know? Uh, Sussman spoke. He spoke very, very well. It's just too bad that Bryant uh, doesn't have the intellect to follow what Sussman is saying. Uh, I'm just let me read you some of what Sussman is saying, you can follow it. I don't know why a judge, a United States District Judge can't follow it. Says Sussman. So, only the causes of action of the amended complaint were at issue in the memorandum and order of February 18th, all of, some of which are to be argued today. Unfortunately, defense counsel has also deliberately misled this court uh, as memorandum in order of February 18th, a reading of that memorandum in order failed to reveal any determination by Bryant, uh, he calls it this court, regarding 47 United States Code 532B.6, explicitly by 47 U.S. Code 545A 1.A and 47 U.S. Code 545E against the defendant TCI. Plaintiff, with the permission of this court, challenges defendant TCI to show where the memorandum in order of February 18th did this court dismiss the causes of action of 47 U.S. Code 545A1A and 47 U.S. Code 545E. Bryant can't follow this. He doesn't know the law and he doesn't have the intellect. If the defendant is unable to prove the truth of his statements, is defendant not perhaps deserving of sanctions? Yes! 
sanction TCI. You heard about somebody cut the cable from TCI over in northern Jersey, put out the whole system? I should think cable uh, operators would catch on, that the public is going to take this stuff from them just for so long, and they have something to worry about. Uh, Bryant Sussman goes on to say, the defendant is correct, however, implying that the amended complaint's cause of action of 47 U.S. Code 532b6, explicitly by 47 U.S. Code 532d, was argued in this court. However, this court has not yet made a determination regarding 47 U.S. Code 532b6. Plaintiff recalls that this court agreed with plaintiff that a dismissal of that cause of action would likely result in an appeal and that that appeal would directly affect or be affected by a similar case in the Court of Appeals Second Circuit, Time Warner versus New York City. Because of the decision of the Honorable Denise Cote, Judge United States District Court, Southern District of New York, Time Warner has so far prevailed against New York City's efforts to replace public access with commercial programming of New York City's own public access channels. Was well, there something else to read you? I got to go get you my converter box. And I got to tell you again that I am cable TV operator free. I had my cable TV disconnected. I no longer have to deal with those thieves and those cheats and those liars, TCI. And so I have my cable box. Now, I don't want you going on paying TCI $3 a month for a cable converter box when you can own your own. This is the kind of ripoff that the telephone company perpetrated on people for decades. Own your own cable TV converter box and stop paying TCI $3 a month for it and never own it. So let me go get the box. Oh, here it is. You can have you plug it simple. You plug your uh, cable in here and you plug your TV in there. And these are all your buttons. Turn it on and you get the channel to one. You can have it. And here's the remote control that goes with it. The value of this is $107. Okay, now, how do you get it? You write the best essay on the purpose and intent of a chat with Glendora and what it is trying to accomplish. Did you hear all that? I was away from the microphone. Okay, uh, what else do we do? Uh, White Plains Public Access does a very good job cable casting a chat with Glendora and I find out that it's on and it's going fine. <coughs> White Plains Public Access uh, does a very good job offering editing for a chat with Glendora from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. every Wednesday. Uh, what else is there to tell you? Gotta tell you some jokes. So on TV is a White Plains Common Council. Um, now, about the field next door, uh, it's at a standstill for the time being. They've cut down the number of stories from 12 to 10 and a half. Uh, the White Plains Common Council and the mayor still have not accepted it, and, and I hope they never do. It's atrocious. It would ruin the highlands. The, uh, Diane says that her husband suffers from insanity, her mother says he doesn't suffer from it, dear. He enjoys it. And TCI has bought a new conference table. It's nine feet wide, it's 30 feet long, and it sleeps 20. Uh, a panhandle said to Arthur, can I have a dollar for a cup of coffee? And Arthur says, a dollar for a cup of coffee? That's ridiculous. And the panhandler says, please, just say yes or no. Don't tell me how to run my business. An article from the New York Times says that the United States Supreme Court uh, 
targets to ponder government-run TV, given that two-thirds of all non-commercial educational television stations are vice governments, the question of their status under the First Amendment is both important and surprisingly unsettled. Two federal appeals courts have disagreed over whether government operated stations that sponsor political debates can exclude minor party candidates who, in their view, in the view of the station management, have not demonstrated a realistic chance of success. Oh, the court today, the Supreme Court that is, accepted an appeal from one of those rulings, a 1996 decision by the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit in St. Louis. Uh, that court ruled that the Arkansas Educational Television Network violated the First Amendment right of an independent candidate for Congress by limiting a 1992 debate to the Republican and Democratic nominees. Writing for the appeals court, Judge Richard S. Arnold said that although the decision to exclude the candidate, Ralph Forbes, was a good faith journalistic judgment based on the lack of visible support, the crucial fact here is that the people making the judgment were not ordinary journalists, they were employees of government. That's an interesting case, isn't it? Noting that Mr. Forbes had not the legal qualifications for appearing on the ballot in the 3rd Congressional District, Judge Arnold said the candidate's exclusion has the effect of a prior restraint. Ha ha! Ha ha! Okay, folks. That's a chat with Lindora as to what happened uh, last week, the week of St. Patrick's, and then what has happened today on March the 24th, 1997, Anno Domini. Keep your courage flaming, guard your rights. Somebody's out there to rip you off and take your rights every second. Sunday afternoon to challenge that. But what I what I didn't get around to saying is that the people here like Lenora, Dino, when I started to want to learn about public access, what did I do?
follow the majority rule. Get me of the American, of the American people.